All right, welcome back everybody. Hope everybody had a very good first day. Um, so today we're going to talk about what happens when you don't have a starting structural model. Um, I would encourage you, this is the first time I've given this talk, so if you have any constructive feedback at the end about things that aren't clear, please let me know. I would really appreciate that. And secondly, there's a lot of different software that can go into different aspects of structure solution. This talk's going to be heavily influenced by things that I have done that have worked for me. That doesn't mean they're the only way to do them. It doesn't even mean they're necessarily the best way to do them. I'm going to, be, I'm going to heavily rely on examples that have worked for me. So, um, but I'm going to try and give you an overview of some of the other tools you can use as well. And for instance, um, I'm not going to specifically have GSAS examples, but Bob has some really nice tutorials for some of the aspects like charge flipping and simulate annealing that you can do with GSAS. And some of those I actually want to try and learn better because I want to see if they'll help me with some problems I haven't been able to solve. So anyways, so why solve a structure from powder data? We mentioned previously that refeld refinement is not a structure solution method. It's a refinement method. So in order to actually do refeld refinement, you have to have an approximate crystal structure that's representative of your material. And the focus of this presentation will be how to get that model when you don't have it, when you've got a new material. Uh, it's worth noting that if you have a single crystal, you really want to make use of it if you can. Um, single crystal diffraction is the most well-known and the most developed method for getting a crystal structure and generally the most straightforward. So if you have a single crystal, it's normally well worth your time to try and use it. Solving structures with powder is generally more challenging, but it's also very rewarding, and particularly if you like puzzles. So it's a pretty interesting undertaking and it's actually kind of addictive. So we talked yesterday about how you lose a lot of information in a powder pattern because you're collapsing 3D structure down onto one dimension. And peak overlap is, makes powder diffraction very challenging compared to single crystal diffraction where you're taking many, many images and getting very good estimates of intensities and positions. So because of the restrictions with powder diffraction uh, and the loss of information, there are some things that typically go into structure solution that are more important than they are with single crystal diffraction. You often really want to have good detailed chemical information up front. Uh, you're going to have to use constraints and or restraints in your solution to keep them chemically reasonable a lot of the time. And you often, if you can, want to get validation with other techniques as well. There's a few things you really want to try before you try solving your structure. First off, you want to make sure you have the best, purest sample you can get. You can save a lot of time in the long run by making sure you have a really high quality sample to begin with. Uh, you want to have a hypothetical chemical formula. And if possible, you want to prove it with elemental analysis. Uh, a lot of the time, you'll have a very good idea based on the stoichiometry you used and the preparation of what compound you've actually synthesized. But even really good scientists often get surprised when they find out what they made is quite the same as what they thought they made. Uh, you want to make sure you have appropriate diffraction data for the task. Really complex problems often require multiple types of radiation. Sometimes you need both synchrotron and neutron, particularly if you have uh, things like heavy elements in the presence of very light elements. And the heavy elements, the scattering with x-rays, will tend to hide the light elements. And finally, you want to make sure that somebody hasn't actually solved your problem for you before. So you want to do searches in things like the powder diffraction file to make sure you can't find your material in there. And if possible, especially with organics, you want to go into the Cambridge Structural Database and do searches on unit cells and formulas and make sure no one has actually found the material that you believe is new. So we talked a lot about the factors that go into uh, describing a pattern. What it really boils down to when you simplify it is your peak positions tell you what kind of unit cell you have. They tell you the symmetry of the unit cell or the space group. The actual peak intensities are what tell you where the atoms are. So it's the intensity observations that are telling you where the atoms are placed within the unit cell. But generally, the thinner the peak width in your pattern, the easier it's going to be to extract both accurate peak positions and peak intensities. 
And that's one of the big reasons why the synchrotron is so useful, because you can often see uh, and resolve details that you can't really see with a lab instrument. This is what's known as the structure solution maze of powder diffraction. So to get through the maze, <coughs> excuse me, to the final structure, <coughs> there are a bunch of steps which you have to complete. And there's decisions you have to make at certain points. And they can be the difference at times between success and failure. And as we go through these steps, I'm going to highlight a bunch of the software I use. I'm going to put a lot of it in parentheses at different points. I'm also going to put references for some of it. Software that's bolded are things I'm most familiar with and that I've used the most. But I've tried to put some of the other things that are out there as well. So these are some of the main steps when you're trying to solve a material. Uh, we'll go into more detail on all of them. Getting data that's sufficient for your task is a critical first step. Um, structure solution isn't guaranteed. So you want to give yourself every advantage you can get from the very beginning. Uh, you have to index the data to determine your unit cell and your space group. This often actually blends into the next step where you do uh, structureless labi or poly refinements to extract intensities or to see how well your cell fits the whole pattern. Often a way of appraising how good uh, cell and space group combination you've got is to test it with these structureless refinements and see how well am I actually fitting the data. Once you think you have an optimal cell and a good labi or a poly refinement, you need to choose an actual method for structure solution. And often this entails trying more than one method until you come up with a basic structure that both explains the pattern well and it also looks chemically plausible. And once you have a basic structure, you test it with Riefeld refinement. And often you will have the basic structure, but you won't have all the fine details. So you'll need to use things like difference Fourier maps to locate things like missing uh, water molecules <clears throat> or other atoms that might be in your structure that you weren't found with the basic solution. And finally, once you get a really good looking Riefeld refinement and you've got a chemically sensible model, it's always good to confirm it or to validate it with other techniques if you can. So here's a little bit of a summary of some of the types of data you might want to use. For many moderately complex samples, XRD on a lab diffractometer is perfectly fine. Uh, it's often preferable to have monochromatic radiation rather than a K-alpha K1, K-alpha 2 doublet. It just simplifies the pattern and makes it easier, particularly for things like the indexing. But lab diffractometer data can be very good for structure solution. For complex, really large cells with low symmetry, synchrotron data is often preferable, uh, especially for the indexing step, because it can be very difficult with if there's a lot of overlap in your pattern to come up with the uh, appropriate and correct unit cell. Uh, if your problem is really complex, I mentioned before, if you have light atoms in the presence of heavy atoms, uh, sometimes you're going to want to have both synchrotron and neutron diffraction. Uh, it's going to aid you in finding the light atoms and uh, you're going to come up with a more robust structural solution. And we won't be discussing magnetic structures here, but if magnetic structure is part of your interest, you really have to use neutrons. It's essential. So once you've got your data, the next step is to figure out the correct unit cell and space group. So ab initio ind indexing is a really interesting step. Uh, depending on the sample purity, your data quality, the complexity of the unit cell, it can actually be the easiest step, or it can be, often be the most challenging or a bottleneck. Uh, there's a lot of different indexing programs, and they use different methodologies. I often start with a program called DICVOL because it's very comprehensive. It uses a very exhaustive strategy. And this makes it really good for finding cells of monoclinic symmetry and higher. Um, because of that exhaustive strategy, it's a little bit slower. So if you suspect you have a triclinic cell, you often want to use a program called Traylor. And I can't overemphasize, indexing is always easier with a pure sample. Um, many of these indexing programs that I've mentioned up here can tolerate a few impurity lines, but you're always better working with a pure sample if you can. So typically what you do is you index the first 20 peaks in the diffraction pattern, 
And some programs like Edo actually prefer a few more peaks and 35 is probably optimal for a program like Edo, but typically it's about the first 20 peaks in your pattern. And there's two figures of merit that are typically used for indexing and evaluating how well that your unit cell explains the positions of the low angle or the high despacing peaks. There's what's called a DeWolf figure of merit, M20. It's defined for 20, the first 20 lines. It can be generalized to more lines, but when DeWolf made this method, he was actually, he had 20 lines in mind specifically. There's also what's called the Smith-Snyder figure of merit, and it's generalized for any number of lines. And in general, you want higher values for both of these figures of merit. For the first one, the DeWolf figure of merit, uh, if you can index your first 20 peaks and get a DeWolf figure of merit that's higher than about 10, you know that your unit cell is substantially correct. Either you've got the optimal solution or you have a solution that probably is very closely related. Yeah, and like I said, for both figures of merit, the higher the value, the better. Since they use different strategies, it's very helpful comparing indexing obtained from more than one program. Uh, I've mentioned using Dickval, and frequently, even if I don't initially get the cell with Dickval, I'll go back and I'll see if I can reproduce the result with that program. And there are software suites like FullProf Suite and Expo that provide access to more than one program, which makes it very easy to compare results and to obtain results from more than one program at the same time. So I make use of both of those suites an awful lot. Once you believe you have the correct cell, there are programs specifically for determining the space group based on systematic absences in the observed reflections. And I often use a standalone program called Check Cell to do this. It's quite old, but it still works very well. And Expo also has those tools built in so that after you find your unit cell, it can do some tests to find the space group. And GSAS can do that as well. It's uh, important to remember that the size of your unit cell should always be a appropriate for a reasonable number of formula units, which depend on the symmetry and specifically the general multiplicity of the space group. So your unit cell contents should always make sense with the unit cell. And there's a number of ways you can consider this. Um, for organic compounds, you can estimate the number of atoms uh, in an organic compound or in the cell by dividing the unit cell volume by typically 17 or 18 angstroms per non-hydrogen atom. And that'll give you an idea of the number of atoms in the unit cell. And some software packages also provide calculators to estimate the volume uh, or compare the volume to the formula or estimate Z. This is a little calculator I made called MAC. Um, which I could give to you. And if you put in your unit cell in your formula, it'll estimate the number of formula units. And it's also nice because you can calculate the density once you've got Z. You can see there's an estimate of Z here. And you can calculate how absorbing your capillary is going to be for capillary experiments. And in this example, I've used calcium hydroxyapatite, so very similar to the fluorapatite we used yesterday. And MAC is estimating that there's about 1.8 formula units. It's not exact, the real number is two, it's always going to be an integer, but it's pretty close. So once you have a tentative unit cell in a space group with a volume compatible with the formula and the expected unit cell contents, the next step is to fit the data with a poly or Lebesgue refinement to see how well your unit cell actually describes your data. Often this step blends into the previous indexing step you may come up with a few different unit cells which look plausible, so you'll test them all with Lebesgue refinement to see which one seems to be the optimal choice. Lebesgue and Pauli methods were devised to facilitate full powder uh, refinement without the need for a crystal structure. So they do require a unit cell, but you don't necessarily even need to know the correct space group. Um, for an unknown structure, you can test different space group options, and settings to see if some are more optimal than others. And both methods fit the peak intensities to best fit the experimental data. So you can use them to extract estimates of the peak intensities, which is often a critical step for a full structure solution. And similar to Riedfeld refinement, these methods work best when you know your instrument resolution, but you can also use them actually to get an uh, estimate of your instrument resolution function, your profile parameters. So the methods are similar, but they have some differences as well. 
Bob mentioned this yesterday, the poly method internally treats every Bragg reflection intensity as a least squares parameter. And this makes it somewhat computationally intensive. The Labai method actually uses an iterative intensity partitioning scheme to obtain the intensities, and they're not actually refined parameters in the model. So mathematically, the Labai method is very similar to the Riefeld method, and more similar than the Poly method, which means it's probably been adopted um, in more Riefeld software than the Poly method. And personally, I've mostly used the Labai method just based on the different software packages I've used for Riefeld, including GSAS and FullProf. Since the Labai and Poly methods um, don't require structures, they're actually very useful for comparison with a Riefeld refinement because they can give you an idea of the best fit you can obtain with the data without worrying about the actual atomic structure. So you can see here for this example, the difference curve is a little bit flatter for the Labai refinement than it is for the Riefeld. And the reduced chi-squared is well within a factor of two for the Riefeld refinement. There's no real hard and <clears throat> fast rule, but if the reduced chi-squared for the Riefeld refinement is more than twice as large as the Labai refinement, you probably want to make, take a closer look, make sure your Riefeld refinement is good and that you're not missing something. In this specific case, we actually confirmed the structure with a DFT optimized uh, structure and found it was very similar to our refined structure, so it gives us a lot more confidence that the actual structure is correct. And towards the end, we'll talk a little bit more about uh, DFT. Once you have a unit cell and a spray scoop combination that agrees with your expected formula, and you've got a decent Labai and poly refinement, the next step is to actually attempt to solve the basic structure. And this occupies the entire top half of our maze here, but there's really two routes for going through. So you can solve a structure with what are called reciprocal space methods or direct space methods. And we'll take a look at both of these methods. Often you won't obtain the exact solution in the initial structure solution, um, but something reasonably close uh, that needs to be manually modified or modified through refinement and doing and looking at density uh, uh, difference Fourier maps. Um, the manual modification often happens uh, when your structure solution, you get things like if you've got polyhedra, you get two atoms occupying the same spot, and so you have to remove an atom, things like that, to connect polyhedra together. So I said there, were, there are different techniques and approaches that are associated with both reciprocal space and direct space methods. I've listed a few of them here with some of the common uh, software packages. Both types of methods have some strengths and weaknesses. Reciprocal space methods generally um, extract the intensities from the PXRD pattern um, using a Labai or poly refinement, and they extract the individual intensities and put that into the structure solution. Um, they require less upfront chemical knowledge than direct space methods uh, about, the unit, about the unit cell contents but they generally require really high uh, quality data for them to be successful. Direct space methods require more upfront chemical information. Um, you often have to build a plausible model, and then what happens is you use global optimization strategies, which manipulate this model and move it around to find possible structures that explain your powder diffraction pattern. So reciprocal space methods for powder diffraction are generally similar to single crystal structure solution methods. Like I said, where they, you extract the intensities of individual Bragg reflections and use them to solve the crystallographic phase problem. Uh, in order for these methods to work, you need enough accurate intensities to find the atoms in the structures, and you need accurate intensities that typically go out to nearly atomic resolution or close to one angstrom. This can be a very uh, challenging problem particularly for low symmetry, large cell compounds. Um, so these methods often work better on smaller, high symmetry structures, and you always want to have really high quality data. A nice advantage of these methods, though, is they typically require less information uh, to get a rough solution 
although more information is still generally helpful to complete the structure and to confirm it's correct at the end. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to do a fairly straightforward structure solution with the Expo software package to give you an idea of how you might go through this. And we're going to look at a crystal structure for cytosine, and it's a purine base, and it forms one of the main building blocks of DNA. Will that come up if it's recording? Oh, unless I just have to be logged in. There we go. Okay. All right, so I'm going to lead you through Expo here. So, sorry, this is the icon I've got for Expo on my desktop. You can see right up here. So I've just opened it up. Expo is made to lead you through the process. It's very friendly that way. So the first thing I'm going to do is just import a diffraction pattern. Hardest part is figuring out where I put it. So this is just a multi-column pattern with two theta and intensities I'm going to bring in. I need to specify my wavelength. So this was collected on CMCFBM with a wavelength of 0 0.68, oops, not zero. 68908 angstroms. Gonna bring this in. So there's my pattern. If I go to pattern here and modify peaks, I can choose peak search conditions. And it's automatically gonna try and identify some peaks. Then what we can do is complete the number of peaks it finds. So typically what I would do for an example like this is I'm gonna get more than 20 reflections. It's gonna use 20 to actually solve the cell. But you want to have a few more, typically, uh, to help with the space group search. So I'm going to cut off this 2 theta at 20 degrees. So I'm going to go from 2 to 20 degrees. I'm going to lower my intensity threshold here to 0.5. So it says it's finding uh, 27 peaks here. I'm going to say OK. But then I'm going to press this button here so I can zoom in on the bottom of the pattern and take a closer look. And if I zoom close enough, you can actually see I'm missing a very small peak right here, which is real. We don't have to include this one, but I'm going to add a few peaks. So I can choose add or delete peaks. And then with just a mouse click, I can add some peaks. And it generally automatically tries to find the maxima. I'm going to add one right here. This should be pretty good. So you, unless you know you've got an impurity, you typically want to try and explain all of the first 20 peaks. If you know you have an impurity, you would exclude those from this step. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask it to index. So I've got three options here. I can index with Treyor, Dickval, or a program called MacMy. I'm going to use Dickval here. I, at times, use all three of these. And so you can see here, Dickfall is suggesting, let's start with search for 20 peaks. I'm going to make the peak position error a little larger. The default here is 0 0.01 degrees. I'm going to make it 0 0.03. Probably for the synchrotron data, 0 0.01 is fine. I think the default when you use Dickfall is normally 0 0.03 if you use it as a standalone piece of software. It's going to look for unit cells here up to a maximum volume of 4,000 angstroms and with a maximum lattice parameter of 30 angstroms. And we're only going to do up to monoclinic uh, symmetry. We're not going to include triclinic symmetry to start with here. And that's sufficient for this example. So basically, it goes in. It looks. You can see it's come up with three cells here. They've all got M20 values that are well over 10. And they're all very closely linked. If you look. They've all got very similar lattice parameters, but the one with the highest M20 by far, an M20 of 67, is the orthorhombic cell. So this is a good sign that that's the right cell. These two monoclinic cells, A, they're a little bit lower symmetry, and B, they've actually got lower M20 values. 
So we'd be inclined to think the orthorhombic cell here is correct, and that is the correct cell. I'm going to say OK. Now what it's going to do is it's going to suggest, ask you to put in an estimate of your unit cell contents. We know our formula here is C4, H5, and 3 O. I'm going to put this in brackets. You can see one formula unit of cytosine is going to occupy a cell volume of about 127 angstroms cubic angstroms. And our total volume of the cell is about 470. So this is strongly suggesting we've got about four formula units in this unit cell. So I'm going to put a four after there, and that's giving us an estimate of about 510 now, fairly close to our 470. And four can be a very uh, reasonable number for an orthorhombic system. I'm going to say OK here, and it just asks us to click Next. What it's going to do now is it's going to do a Lebai refinement, figure out what it thinks are peaks, and it's going to give suggestions of the possible space groups. Once again, in this case, it's suggesting P212121. This is a very common orthorhombic space group. Uh, it appears an awful lot for organics, and it's indeed the correct solution. And the figure of merit it's giving here is more than twice as high as the second best option. In which, and in that case, it's actually giving um, an extinction group. So, with a different space group, the final space group you can choose. So, we're going to use P212121 here. And it's going to adopt that space group and it's going to do another Lebai refinement to extract the intensities. And then it's going to actually try the structure solution. You can see it's putting atoms around, and very quickly this came to a similar solution. Now I say similar. This isn't exactly the right solution. You'll notice the three nitrogens are all part of the ring. If we look at the actual molecule for cytosine, the nitrogen is on one of the terminal, it's on the ligand. So we are close to the right solution, but this is where having your chemical information and knowledge really helps you. So we're very close, though. In the views here, you can choose symmetry. So you can look at the packing of the molecule to see how it's packed. You can put in your unit cell axes to see how they fit into the unit cell. So we're most of the way here to a structure solution for cytosine. You'd want to go through now, and you'd want to make sure. So in this case, we'd want to swap a carbon and a nitrogen around to put them on the correct places, because we Presumably, we know the molecule when we're starting our solution here. You'd want to go in and figure out where you think hydrogen atoms would be and whether they make reasonable hydrogen bonds between the various different molecules. But we're well on our way to actually solving a structure. So I'm going to give you a warning. In reality, it never, I've chosen this example because it's tractable in five minutes in front of you. <laughs> it never really works this way, <laughs> or very, very rarely. Um, Expo is a really good thing to try because when it works, it works beautifully. You saw how fast the solution came out there. It only looked for the solution for like 10 seconds or something. Often it will pop out if you've got good enough data and an appropriate level of symmetry and quality of data, the solution will often pop out within a couple of minutes. But I find it works like 10 to 20% of the time. Often it doesn't work. So we're going to talk now a little bit more uh, about direct space structure solution methods. So direct space methods use the entire pattern rather than extracting integrated intensities. And they were designed from the very beginning with powder diffraction in mind. All of these methods use algorithms that move model fragments around in the unit itself, and they compare the resulting calculated pattern to your observed one. And when the agreement improves, generally the model is saved. Sometimes even when the agreement doesn't improve, uh, depending on a probability, uh, the model will still be saved, depending on the type of solution, you're, uh, solution method you're using. Uh, so for direct space methods, uh, you have to create an appropriate starting model. 
in order to use them correctly. Um, for inorganics, typically what you need to know is the elemental composition and the expected coordination polyhedra that might be present in the structure. For organics, you need reasonable starting models for the molecules that are present in the structure, which often requires model building, particularly if the molecule you're interested in hasn't actually been solved before in a crystal structure. Um, a big advantage of direct space methods is that they can be successful with lower quality data and with less data content than reciprocal space methods. So we're going to look here at a direct space structure solution uses, using a parallel tempering with a program called FOX. And this is using laboratory data. So the compound is a drug called Trandolopro. It's used to treat hypertension or high blood pressure. We, I mentioned it briefly yesterday. And this powder pattern can be indexed pretty easily with Dickfall. I'm not going to do that step this time. And once again, it actually has space group uh, 212121 a very common space group for organic compounds. And I couldn't find an example of a crystal structure that had trandolopril in it, so I had to actually build the molecule. So what I did here was I searched for fragments of the molecule in the Cambridge Structural Database to come up with um, entries in the Cambridge Structural Database which explain at least half of the molecule. And I came up with a number of possible options for each half and then ended up choosing two. You can see I've these six letter codes right up here. The six letter codes on each one are uh, the Cambridge entry numbers. So what I did was I downloaded these entries from Cambridge and then I manually removed the atoms I didn't need and this was as simple as plotting them, seeing which atoms corresponded uh, to the various atom labels and then removing them with a text editor to obtain half of each molecule of the Trendolopo molecule. Then I opened each of these fragments in a chemical editor program. I use something called Avogadro, mainly because it's free. Um, it's not the easiest thing to use, and I think there are easier software tools out there to do the same thing if you're willing to pay money for them. Um, in my case, I'm not for this purpose, so I use Avogadro. And I basically opened both fragments in Avogadro and connected them via this nitrogen and this nitrogen to create a molecule that looks something like this. Once you have the Trandolopro molecule, you can upload it into Fox and use it as a model for your structure solution. And the easiest way to do this is to convert the SIF file into a format that's called a fenske halsted matrix, which is very easy to create. You use the software called OpenBabel, and it's really nice because it's easy to download and it's very easy to use and it actually facilitates conversion between dozens of different chemical file formats. It's very helpful. Now I'm gonna give you a brief introduction to Fox. So Fox is right here below Expo. So I'm going to open up Fox. In this case, I've done some of the file creation here initially. You can see there's different tabs here. There's a crystals tab where you put in the unit cell, the unit cell contents. There's a powdered fraction tab. When I open this, let's open the file first so you can actually see something useful. Once again, sometimes the hardest part is figuring out where I put it. Oops, not Avogadro Fox. No, actually, let's use that. Okay, so I've opened this up. Typically what I'll do is I make this console about this size so you can see some things. I can open the crystal structure or open the atoms. I'll put that down in the bottom here. And I'll open the powder pattern, show graph as well. So really the things you need to put into Fox are on the crystal tab. You need to put in your unit cell. So you'll see here I've defined my unit cell with my last parameters and my space group, P212121. 
you have to import a Fenske Hall Z matrix. So what I can do here, oops, I'm going to remove my scatterer. I've actually got the trend all from molecule in here. Now I've taken it out, but what you can do is you bring in this Fenske Hall Z matrix. The Z matrix looks something like uh, something like this. So it lists the number of atoms that are in the molecule, and then it lists distances. Uh, a distance between the first and second atoms, and then it uh, describes them with a series of distances and angles to build the whole molecule. And again, you can make this very easily with Open Babel, and it's a very easy way to import it into Fox. So you'd import the, the uh, molecule, and typically you'd start with a randomized configuration. So you just ask it to randomize where the molecule is. And once it starts what's called the parallel tempering process, it's going to move this molecule around to try and explain the powder diffraction pattern. You can bring in the pattern as well. You need to put in the wavelength. So I've got the wavelength here. You need to put in the, polar, the polarization rate. This was on an uh, instrument with no monochromator, so I've got a linear polarization rate of 0.5 here. And you'd have to add a background. In this case, what I do it considers the background as a phase. So I actually import a crystalline phase for this. I've already done it. And you can import a background, and it'll interpolate between points to give you an initial background. Once you've got both the crystal structure and the pattern in, you can do a Lebai refinement. And I'm right-clicking here on the pattern, and it'll open up a Lebai window. It's got a very good quick fit um, Lebai module here. Basically, I just leave everything checked except for the uh, zero fit, and you can let it automatically do the Lebai refinement. So it's right now it's uh, it's fitting here just with a structureless refinement to get a good fit to the of the profile parameters to the pattern, and this looks pretty good. Once you've got a good Lebai refinement, you would go to the global optimization tab. You have to choose optimized objects with this button. So in this case, what we want to optimize is we're optimizing the crystal for trandolopril, and we're optimizing the powder pattern. And the default algorithm they use is something called parallel tempering. And there's very little you have to choose. You generally leave the defaults. The defaults are well optimized for the most part in the parallel tempering algorithm. You typically pick how many trials you want something to run. So this is the number of moves it will make. The number, uh, the number of trials in a single run. And then you typically let it run for numerous runs where it goes through that number of trials, and it will save the solutions as it goes, the best solutions. So for something this size, I would typically pick 2 million trials per run. And by putting a minus 1 in here, it will just do an infinite number of runs until we stop it. And if I start running it here on multiple runs, you'll see it's going to start to fit. And you can see this cost function value just starts to go down. And it started to do simulated in, or, uh, parallel tempering, where it's moving these molecules around, trying to find a good fit to the pattern. This can take quite a while. So we're actually going to leave this right now. We'll come back maybe at the end and look and see where it's at. But you can see every step it does, it will update. It's going to move the, um, every time it makes a change, it's going to move the, uh, atoms down here, and it's going to update the calculated powder pattern and the agreement, and it'll update that cost. So this is sort of how this works. My first time. Ten minutes left. Okay, let's boogie. All right. Often I'll leave it like overnight. I'll let it do 20, 30, 40 runs of 2,000 million cycles each. And then I'll take a look at some of the best solutions and see which one. I'll, you'll, see if, you'll look and see if there's some common solutions that are very low cost to give you an idea of, of how good the solutions are and look and see if they're chemically reasonable. So this is the final Riedfeld refinement that I obtained with GSAS.
You'll notice this was collected on a lab instrument in, transi in transmission geometry, and the data quality is really high, but there's not a lot of data content. This only goes out to about 40 degrees, or a despacing of about 2.2 angstroms. Um, you would have little or no chance of solving this structure with reciprocal space methods uh, using this data. One important point for Rietveld refinement of an organic molecule like this is you have to use restraints on things like bond lengths and bond angles to keep the solution chemically reasonable. And a way you can do this is a software package called Mogul. So Mogul is a tool that comes with the Cambridge Structural Database. With Mogul, you simply upload your file into it, and it will identify all the bonds. And with an all-fragment search, um, it will produce a list of bonds and angles and torsion angles and rings for all the non-hydrogen atoms in your structure. And it does this by comparing uh, the values of your molecule with similar entries in the Cambridge Structural Database. So it comes up with a list. You can see here Mogul gives you a list of bonds like this. It'll tell you the number of similar bonds. In this case, I think it's saying there's more than 20,000 bonds it found that were similar to some of these bonds. It'll give you mean and median values for all this, for each of these. You'll notice there's a separate tab here for bonds, for angles, for torsion angles, and for rings. So it identifies all these fragments. And typically you use the uh, mean and the standard deviation in order to create restraints in GSAS on bond lengths and angles. And these restraints are used as extra observations. You're basically supplementing your data by saying, we know this bond and or this angle should be very close to this value. Often what you'll do, you can actually weight separately your powder data versus your restraints. Often what you'll do is you'll start with a very high value uh, of weight on the uh, restraints until you get somewhere into the refinement, and then gradually you lower the weighting of the restraints so that you're put as you get close to the final solution, and you put more weight on your actual data because you don't want the restraints to dominate the, the refinement. You really want to, you want to refine the data, you want to guide it in the early stages. So once you have a tentative structure, it's important to take a few steps uh, to make sure it, that it's likely correct. You really want to get a high quality refinement uh, with reasonable statistic me statistical metrics. And visually, you want to make sure the pattern looks, the refinement looks very good. Uh, you want to make sure that your structure is consistent with elemental and chemical analysis that you may have. Um, certainly, X ray fluorescence, um, ICPMS data can be very valuable for looking at the composition. NMR data can tell you parts about the structure. Um, you want to make sure the structure itself just looks chemically reasonable. Um, you want to make sure it doesn't contain features that are unusual. And ideally, if you can, you might take a look at your Rietveld refined structure and compare how well it agrees with something like a density functional theory optimized structure. So for chemical reasonableness, uh, for organic structures, often you'll run your final refined structure back through Mogul to take a look and see if it identifies any bonds or angles that look unusual. And it'll compare um, what it believes the, what the value you input to what it believes the value should be based on similar observations. And you can highlight things that look unusual in your molecule. For inorganic structures, doing a bond valence sum calculations is a very helpful way of figuring out whether your structure looks reasonable. And I tend to use a program called Bond Strength or Bond Stray, <laughs> however you say that, in the full prof, full prof suite. Um, and for either type of structure, when you think you've got a, <clears throat> a final structure, you probably want to put your SIF through CheckSIF, which is available on the IUCR website right here. I mentioned earlier density functional theory. Um, so what is DFT? DFT is essentially a quantum calculation technique that uses the electron density as a basic quantity to calculate electronic structure and properties and systems. I don't have time to go into the theory, and I wouldn't do it justice anyways. So I've put a few good resources here you can take a look at um, if you were, were interested. And there's many programs which can uh, perform DFT. We use a license for Crystal at the CLS, and I've used that for an example that I'll present here. <clears throat> 
So DFT can be very complementary for powder diffraction work, or more broadly, experimental work in general. Uh, for many experiments, it's uh, critical to validate your results and make sure your interpretation of your data is correct. And DFT can be an excellent tool for doing this. Um, it can provide more accurate structural details than are observed by the experiment for some things. Particularly, x-rays don't see hydrogen very well. So finding hydrogen in your structure, DFT can be a very good tool for getting more accurate hydrogen positions than you can from the experiment. And it can also give you potentially give you additional insights into your material. Particularly for complex organic structures, PXRD and DFT can be very complementary because PXRD gives you the crystal lattice and it gives you the basing packing arrangement, but DFT can help you provide the fine details, especially with regards to the hydrogen atoms. Even with synchrotron data, you generally can't refine hydrogen atoms positions with PXRD. Most of the time, they just don't scatter strongly enough. So DFT can be a very complementary tool to get a full picture of your structure. And the agreement between PXRD and DFT can even be used to validate the correctness of the crystal structure. These guys actually looked at 200 published PXRD crystal structures and compared the average RMS displacement in the atoms between the uh, PXRD and the DFT models. And generally correct crystal structures will have an RMS difference here below about 0.3 angstroms. If you get between over uh, 0.4 angstroms, generally these examples were incorrect. The powder diffraction solution was wrong or there were significant problems with it. If you're in between about 0.3 and 0.4, you're sort of in a gray area where you want to take a really careful look at what you're doing. And this gives you an idea of what this looks like. Here are two pharmaceutical structures, and they've got very different levels of agreement between the PXRD and the DFT. So this DFT structure for solifenacin has a very low RMS uh, displacement. You can see the DFT and the Riedfeld models overlap almost perfectly. With this muperosin uh, crystal structure, the general packing is right, but it's pretty clear the fine details are wrong. Almost there. And so I'm just gonna do one other example here. This is a drug called denepazil. It was one of the first drugs that was brought to market for the treatment of mild to moderate Alzheimer's disease. And I'm actually using lab PXRD here with a pretty low two theta limit of about 35 degrees. Um, this is not a lot of uh, diffraction data. Our minimum despacing is about 2.5 angstroms. Um, I got a pretty nice oh, excuse me, crystal structure with this. It looks chemically reasonable, but my first question should be, is it actually correct? And based on the DFT, it looks like we've got the correct crystal structure. The DFT agrees really well with the actual refined crystal structure. And once you've got the DFT, uh, it's very helpful for describing hydrogen bonding and even deciding what a hydrogen bond, uh, what constitutes a hydrogen bond in your structure. You can use tools within the DFT like uh, what's called Mulliken overlap populations, which tell you how much the actual electron density is overlapping between atoms, and it can help you make decisions on what are real hydrogen bonds in your structure. All right, and we're just about at the end. So I put a little summary here of some of the different software I've mentioned. There's a lot of software in there. Most of it is freeware, the exceptions being the databases on the top line and Crystal, we had to purchase a license, but it was pretty reasonable price and it's forever. Um, this is not a comprehensive list either of software that can be used for uh, structure solution. This is a lot of the software that I'm most familiar with. And most of it, like I said, is freely available from the authors. So structure solution, it can be very powerful uh, from powders. And in some cases, it's the only option you have. Some things are very hard or impossible to crystallize uh, as large single crystals. But more than single crystal diffraction, you really have to have a significant amount of chemical and starting information about your uh, actual material. You have to use things like constraints and restraints in order to obtain chemically reasonable solutions. And it's very important often to validate and verify your structure if you can.
And I'd really like to just acknowledge, uh, I've worked a fair bit and done a lot of collaboration with a guy named Jim Kadek, who is very, very good at this. And I owe him a great debt because a lot of what I've learned about both structure solution and density functional theory has been come from Jim. And here's a few books that provide a lot of information uh, about structure solution. In particular, the top two provide a lot of the technical details and more of the mathematics of the techniques I've explained today. So, and with that, if you have any questions. Okay. Uh, one is, let's see if I can get to remember all of them. Um, <laughs> in the sample preparation, rather obviously, you want to avoid texture film. You have to do whatever you have to do to make sure that there's no texture in the sample, because that screws up the intensities and basically will prevent you from solving the structure. Uh, second point is that. Higher resolution is always better. Uh, you can do things with synchrotron radiation at a high resolution with a you can't do it in a laboratory because you simply can't separate the reflections enough to be able to get the information in the um, You always want